Okay. But anyway, what you, so what do you, what's on your mind, kid? This is my brother Eric. Over the years, a lot has happened to this guy. A lot bordering on the ridiculous. And everyone in my family knows this because he would constantly tell us these stories about his misadventures. A lot of times, we'd be in them. Now, it's hard to determine exactly what's true and what's not. And we aren't mainly going on the word of a somewhat unreliable narrator. No, there's no explosions or fights with bad guys or feats of strength happening in any of these stories. Eric is more like a sitcom star than he is an action hero. These days, most of the stories he's told have been retired. But I've been able to convince him to dust off these old tales and share them with us on this podcast. Do I need to hit record or anything? No, I'm already recording. These are the stories my brother used to tell. Today's episode, The Secret Car. One note, one of the names in this story has been changed. This story takes place less than a year after the Maritza story from episode one. If you haven't already listened to that one, you might want to go back and check it out. But here, Eric is 16 and dealing with life without a car or a driver's license, which he's not allowed to get until he turns 18. Oh, and a quick reminder that when Eric says Joe D, he means our father. So at this point, I'm a year into my sentence of... No car, no license, no nothing until I'm 18. And I'm adapting to that pretty okay because, you know, I didn't have a car before that. I couldn't do it before. It just is now everybody around me, you know, is aging into having cars and I don't. My dating situation is okay, but I obviously have way less freedom and You know, a second part of that is the fact that when I was 14, I was given the opportunity to have a job. Eric ends up getting a job at Cazuli's Pizzeria, a restaurant on the second floor of the local mall, the Pompano Fashion Square. It's not the coolest place, and the job is horrible. It's horrible. But I'm earning, you know, like, you know, 90 bucks a week. And after I pay... Joe D, his 25% of my pay goes to him. So after that, I've got 70 bucks, 60, 65 bucks. The whole thing goes to Nikes and Levi's and triangle shirts. And I live at Chess King and Merry-Go-Round and Renegade. And let me tell you what happens. I immediately become cool. Just like that. So draw from that what you will. But what happens is my social life goes nuts. And at this point, I don't, again, I don't have a car, but I'm pretty comfortably dating. And, you know, I've got my, my little groove on at 16. So working at the mall and, and the negative of that is that in order to keep myself in the style in which I'm accustomed, I've got to work all the time and particularly during the school year which is no problem from the family this means that i'm getting up at 6 a.m and i'm getting home at 10 p.m and all that time is school and job so dating during the week very difficult obviously you know we've got school hours so then comes the weekend and again I'm working I'm working like Saturday 11 to 9 and then Sunday 10 to 6 so maybe I have one or two chances to go anywhere you know if I have a girlfriend so this complicates things but this is the style of it okay and come that uh, May or June of a, a girl comes in to work at the restaurant and she's an older woman this is Judy. And not just an older woman, you know, she's a whole year older. But to this point, I have not dated anybody older. Okay, my range at 16 is 15 and 16. And that's it. Okay, 14 is, you know, 
Again, these are social stigmas, okay? You don't go down past one year. That No, then you're weird. Oh, you're, you're, you're lame for doing that. So I got 16 and I got 15. 17 would be, you know, nice because there were girls all the time that were available, that were in our range, but all of a sudden they were dating some college jackass and that caused immediate hate towards that whole situation. There was no competing. They had a car, they had a real job. They were gonna be something with a degree. You couldn't compete with those people. And you know, they were fully grown and everything. What the, that wasn't even fair. But here we were, limited 15, 16. So here comes this girl, she's 17. And not only is she 17, but She doesn't live with her parents. She's kind of on her own. She's moved from Chicago, so she doesn't know a lot of people. She wants the job, not again, because she's interested in, you know, the social aspects of it, because she needs the money. So she's got a very different outlook on life than I do at this time. However... Well, you know, what can I say? You know, the Eric D charisma is very strong at this point. You know, I've got all my mojos are lined up. Okay. My, you know, shoulders have spread and you know what I mean? Starting a little bit of facial hair and things like this are occurring. Okay. And so she's a, I'm appealing to her. It's not my fault guys. Okay. The only problem is, is that in comparison, I've got like the lifestyle of a child in comparison. This is not revealed immediately because, you know, the flirting, what have you happens at the job on the job. And so I probably appear to have my shit together a little better than it looks like. And at this point, what you know, she's, we're already like attracted and what have you. And so then we start to date. And it's immediately a concern because, you know, oh, well, my curfew, you know, is 11. And so, you know, we get out of here at 930. So you want to go to the, you want to go to Walgreens and get a soda? What's on the schedule tonight, babe? And she's like, whoa, the lameness is heavy in this area now. All of a sudden, the charisma, pew, pew, pew. So I immediately feel the pressure of this. Okay, this is no no good at all. She's almost demanding of me like, hey, you know, what are you going to do about that lousy bullshit curfew? I noodle this around and I think, okay, it's worth another try. Okay, because the pressure I'm under, you know, I'm going to lose all my standing. And I don't think I, I honestly, I don't think I can handle it. So I've got no choice. What I've got to do is start creating a social experience that occurs at like, you know, between midnight, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., something like that. That's all I can do. I'm not going to give up the job. I need the job just to even be in the ball game. So what else? I can't miss school. This is it. So here we go. So now, if you're paying attention, it probably looks completely suspicious, but... I don't know if they're paying any attention, but now I'm really zoning in on exactly their cues for bedtime. Before this, nobody gives a shit. We don't care, okay? Because we're doing our own thing in our own parts of the U, they're doing their thing and so on. Now all of a sudden I'm making sure that any last minute things in the kitchen need to be done, they're done. Make sure everybody's comfortable and watching every little thing they do. And I realize exactly, you know, their little procedure. I get that down and now I just have to wait because at this point there are occasions when Joe D will pop out. You know, he's done little pop outs in the kitchen. Doesn't mean he goes and checks. He's not Mike Brady. Okay. There's no, okay guys, good night. You know, where he peers in the door and he turns the light off. Okay. It's bed. All right. Have a good night. All right. Click the light. No, never. But still I want to be extra sure because getting caught would be disastrous. So, I lay there and wait. Everybody's asleep and I make my first shot. First thing that I got to do, which is also to my advantage, is that we have, if you recall, we have our own air conditioning. We don't have central air in this house at this time. We have our own air conditioning units that all suck. But mine in particular is never cold enough because I'm never going to ever be cool enough. Eric ran his air conditioner all the time. 
So much so that our father would complain about this, saying he's jacking up the electric bill with his constant usage. So Eric ends up paying $2 a day to run the AC. That's 60 bucks a month, which has to be more than what the entire bill was for 1986. What this means is my air conditioner is the only one in the house that's running 24 hours a day. And I mean 24 hours, even when I'm not home, because I will tell you, as I did to them, it needs to run when I'm not here, because when I get home, I don't want to be. I'm hot when I get home. It's got to be ready. Okay, there's no remotes. There's no Wi-Fi. You got to have that thing going. Otherwise, you come in and it's hot. And it was Florida freaking hot, as you all know. So... This works to my advantage because if you were to come down the hallway, you would hear that thing because those things ran super loud. So it's running and cranking and, you know, the hamsters, whatever's in there is just cranking and cranking and crank. So if you think you're going to hear me in there sleeping, you know, get any sense of it, you won't. You're not going to hear me sneaking out because of it. I lock the door and I, <laughs> and I put a chair up against the door. And here's why I put a chair up against the door. I know, sounds crazy, right? But what I'm thinking is, if you're getting in, I'm already caught, okay? I've already gone through that trick, okay? So, in desperation, maybe you just won't be able to get in, and, and who knows? Anything I can do to delay you getting in is better. So, 16-year-old brain. So, I do the whole thing where you, you know, wedge the chair into the door. Now I'm really, nobody's getting in. Okay, you might catch me, but I don't know how. Okay, you're gonna have to go through a window yourself. Now, open the jealousy. I put a crate under there because there's a drop. And so part of the getting back in would be having to leap up in there. So I got a crate there and I get out and now I run. And I actually looked this up recently just to see how (laughs) far away it was. So at this point, she's got her own apartment and it's 2.9 miles from the house. So it's just under three miles, which is no problem. It makes no sense to me now, but at the time was not a big deal. I actually ran a lot back then. I ran, you know, not track or anything like that, but I was a runner. You know, I would go out and run, you know, sometimes eight, nine miles at a a shot with my Walkman and all that. So it really wasn't a big deal. So the only problem was, you know, here's your set of obstacles. There's different degrees of peril throughout this trip. First, of course, is the whole setup and the getting out the window. That's the first one because there definitely is, you know, you gotta be silent and all that. So I get out the window and now what you gotta do is go down the side of the U on the outside. So that's the side of the house again, furthest away, but there is a gate at the end. It's another, it's a six foot gate. It's wooden and it's got the uh, metal hinges on it. And, you know, you think that a teenager with a brain, but no, that thing, when you open it. Okay, so then instead of doing anything about that, I just close it very slowly. And then I'm running. Now you got to run past the house. This is the part, this is what you would call the exposure period. So any time here in the next few minutes before I can get out to the main road, which is Sample Road, is terrifying because there's an excellent chance that if you're on to me right now, you're going to catch me, okay? Because whatever's tipped you off, there's only a general path I'm going to take. I'm running. You you are going to be in a car. So this is a terrifying time. Get to the main road, which is Sample Road. And now a little level of safety because it's like, no, no, I'm out here in the world. You know, anybody could be out here. Who knows? You may see me. You may not. However, of course, way more visibility. Okay, you run your ass for 2.9 miles. I get there, I'm prepared, okay? I'm a slovenly, sweaty mess. She understands that. So the first thing I do is I take a shower and I brought a change of clothes, okay? So an extra pair of sweatpants and whatever, okay? So she's all in for that. I take the shower, appear in something more comfortable. And then the two hour socialization period occurs. And so now, of course, is the return of the dread because now you got to go home. And I haven't been caught all this time, right? Keep this in mind. These people, these parents of mine, have no idea where this girl lives. Zero, nothing. Probably don't even know she lives on her own. 
So while I'm there, this is where I'm the absolute safest. So I go from that feeling of even if they were looking for me, they're not going to find me to now I got to go back into the breach. And this is the absolute scariest part. Again, you got to run your ass. You're a sweaty mess. You have no idea what's been occurring here for hours. Nothing, you, you don't know that the police, you know, what you're going to pull up and see fire trucks and police and SWAT or whatever. You have no idea. So heart pounding, pounding, pounding. Okay. You see nothing. No lights on. <sighs> okay. This feels pretty good. All right. So now we still got to get back inside. Got to go through the gate. Go down the hall. Then outside climb back in looking in the bedroom before i even hop in okay looks the same air conditioner crank it crank it crank it okay okay all right hop in rearrange everything pull the chair down close the thing change the clothes land in the bed boom i did it oh my gosh i pulled it off i finessed it okay so life is good So now I report to her, hey, guess what? You know, we're going to have dates like three, four nights a week. The only problem with this now is that now my um, period of being out in the world and not getting any like regular rest or health or any of that extends now to the middle of the freaking night. But thank the good Lord that I'm 16. So endless amounts of, of energy. Okay, so now this has become a regular thing. I'm doing this. Summer comes and so it gets even better okay because first of all I'm, I'm really practiced at it so i've got it down to a, really a science where i'm almost not even concerned except for on the return that's the only time just in case and it's during this time that i'm on one of my jaunts and as i'm out there on sample road a car approaches me as i'm as i'm jogging along and the guy signals me hey eric I'm like, oh my God, okay, who's this? Some little car, and he pulls off on the side, and, and, and I realized that it's my next door neighbor, Jeff. And Jeff is, is I'm going to say he's probably around 40. He's married, and he's got a daughter that at this time is probably 10 or 11, something like that. And so you would think ostensibly a regular sort of family guy, but this guy's got a, you know, a couple of idiosyncrasies, but there he is. He's like, what are you doing? What, what, what are you doing out here at 1 a.m.? I'm like, I got a decision to make here, right? Eric makes the decision to tell Jeff what he's up to, not knowing how he'll react. He's like, oh, okay, so the old the, you're doing the old sneaking out thing. Yeah, you know, look on his face, looks like he's accepting of this. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Oh, man, well, how far away is it? And I say, it's 2.9 miles. No, I don't know how far. I say, it's down there past the thing, past Federal on the left. And he's like, oh, you want to ride? And even though I've got it down to a science, (laughs) I say, because I'm thinking about the whole sweat factor, the shower factor and all that. And I'm like, yeah, I do want to ride, in fact. So he gives me the ride. He's at this point right now, I can see him sort of vicariously enjoying the situation. So, gonna go see the girl, huh? Yeah, the old sneaking out thing. Look at you. What are you gonna... Like, okay, don't want to talk with you too much, but this ride was nice. He says, well, you know, what time are you gonna be done? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure, even though I am sure. You know, I'm out of there at 3 a.m. every time. I don't play around too much. I'm very responsible with my sneak outs, okay? I don't push past 3 a.m. So, so he says, no, the reason I ask is because, you know, I'm going to be down over here at the porthole. And the porthole <laughs> is the name of a strip club that is, very, you know, it, it would definitely uh, be in the category of a dive. And I don't know that other than from like word of mouth, you know, like we even have jokes about the porthole because it's on the main drag of the area that we live. It's a place called the porthole. I, I got to imagine that they're marketing, you know, like, that, I don't know, something with holes that relating to stripping, you know what I mean? The portholes and what have you. I don't remember, but you could drawing conclusions it's like i'm gonna be over at the porthole and i'm gonna be there probably a couple hours so i was thinking if you're gonna be needing a ride home maybe i can meet up with you and bring you back so yeah i think all right this again 
Not bad, because Jeff lives right next door. He's the very next door neighbor, okay? So I'm thinking again about my the scariest part, which is the reapproach to the house. Now I'm going to be doing that in a car. Jeff is there. I start thinking about like, you know, sort of like buffer type situations. And this doesn't seem like it could hurt me besides the fact that I don't have to, you know, I would make my trip 20 minutes less. I'm not a sweaty mess, etc. So I agree. Like, yeah, okay, I'll meet you on the corner over there and, and so on. And this is successful, okay? To the point where we actually have like a little bit of a relationship, you know? Like during the day, I will see him and he'll say to me, so, is you know, is tonight, it's going to be one of your nights? Yeah, it is. All right, I'll meet you on the corner over here. Boom, I give you the ride. And so we get into sort of a rhythm with this where I'm sneaking out. He's giving me the entire full ride. I don't need a change of clothes. I don't need a shower. I have a longer time. And when he comes home, I get home. And, you know, there's, again, a little bit of sense of security. This is working, okay? All you people judging, it's working like a champ. Do you think... He himself is sneaking out of his house to go to the porthole. Okay, I'm, I was pretty sure of that at the time, and I'm 100% positive of it. I wouldn't know that to, for sure, but during the time that we spent, which was a de- decent amount of time, he did all the typical jackass husband kind of chatter, you know, which was bagging on her all the time. And, you know, he was he was doing the whole management labor thing you know talking down about everything so there we are again things are going well it's it's working out very smoothly the the only interesting i guess an interesting thing would be the fact that he appeared in several different cars because he had a little you know side gig i don't know what his real gig was but he had a side gig where he would buy cars and then just to make that curb appeal to their home He would also have all these jalopy kind of cars out in his yard and they'd be all across the grass. They'd be, you know, he had a circle drive. They'd be in the drive. They'd have signs on them. And I didn't know anything about that. I didn't care. But we would be driving in any one of those cars at any given time. So at this point, like I said, it's it's going real smooth and my life is improved. You know, I've got the the social aspect of this covered. You know, I'm I'm in no danger of losing any standing in the community. And I, I guess at this time would be when I get a little bit complacent. And in one regard, you could say, you know, Eric, you've done this six times in a row successfully, but every single time you still squeak in that gate shut. And, you know, this could be solved. WD-40... Or maybe more appropriate would be some old-timey can of oil that we would have had back then. And and then you got a silent gate. But no, it doesn't occur to me. Everything's going right. One night, Jeff's not available for his usual ride, which isn't that unusual. So Eric goes with the backup plan, which is to run to Judy's and take a shower as soon as he gets there. Which, which happens immediately, okay? I waste no time with that. I get out of the shower... And as soon, just about as soon as I do, on the door, it's 1.15 in the morning. This has never happened at her apartment. And now there's a knock. I'm immediately terrified. And I'm looking at her. Who's at the door? Who's at the door? And she's like, I don't know who's at the door. Go check. Go check. I don't live here. Why would I check? You should check. You should check. It's your 1 a.m. knock at the door. And she's like, no, I don't want to check. I'm like, whoa. That felt terrible. So, all right. It's got a peephole, okay? So I approach, and let me tell you, the approach is literally on all fours, crawling over to the door, trying not to poop myself. And I don't, again, I've had, think about it, I've had zero concerns to this point. I'm doing this for a couple of months and I've had nothing to worry about. And as soon as the knock happens, I'm thinking all the worst possibilities. So I crawl over there, you know, I do the, the serpentine over to the door. And then I kind of crawl up the side of the door and there's the peephole. And then I just barely 
just poke my head just slowly 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 now i'm at the door boom it's joe d's fucking eye right there looking at me in the peephole i drop to the floor drop to the floor i'm making sounds but i'm covering myself (laughs) judy's looking okay all i can say is if you're judy it's over Okay, these 90 seconds of the Eric Delgado experience have ruined everything. And that is, that's understandable. And you know what? I don't give a shit. I'm looking up at that door. I'm not going back up there. Okay, I'm just looking and I'm making no sound. Now Judy's giving me the like, come on, do, do something sort of urging. Wait, when I'm like, shut your mouth. Nothing. Just waiting. I'm just, I'm just thinking... Okay, somehow Joe D has not only found that I'm out, okay, that I'm not in the bedroom with the the door and the chair and the air conditioner and the whole thing. He's gotten through all my defenses, knows I'm out, and somehow knows where I am. Out of all the six billion places I could be, here he is. And it's like six minutes after I got here. This is what I'm thinking about. And I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe he'll just leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I do nothing. I don't move. Okay. From the moment the peephole, I, and I shot to the floor like a little cricket and I'm down there, you know, cricketing and I'm not moving. One of us is something's going to, it ain't me. It ain't going to be me. So after, I don't know, a minute, right? Another knock at the door. Okay. All right. Okay. So maybe he's not. So maybe he's not leaving. Fine. I don't care. That knock didn't bother me. I already know you're out there. Not. No. You got the wrong apartment, old man. I am not in here. You don't know I'm in here. Until he see, until we have a physical face-to-face confrontation you don't know that i'm inside of here you don't i'm looking for egress points at this point there's no way it's an apartment i'm on the second floor i'm thinking about going out another window but her windows are all on the same side as the door there's no other opportunity because i would have gone out a window let me tell you okay so now he starts he starts talking to the door. Now I have like, not just the eye for confirm. Now I have the audio confirmation. And there he is at, you know, 115. Come on, Eric. Come on. I know you're in there. What are you doing? Come on. Look, will you just, oh, just come to the door? Will you just come to the door? No, I'm not going. So he takes this for like another minute, right? Eh? And I'm like, all right, that's the worst he can do. That's the worst he can do. No, no, that's not the worst he can do. The next you've seen in every horror movie is the doorknob jiggling. He starts the jiggles. Chicken, 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 chicken. Ah, he's going to get in. He's going to get in. Looking at Judy. Go save yourself. That's it. Eric, come on. Seriously. All right, now I've seen the worst he can do. He's got to leave, okay? The cops are going to come. Something's going to happen. This is illegal. So it gets worse. There's lights outside along the sort of courtyard. They're shining outside, even though it's 1 a.m. So he steps over to the big window that they've, she's got next to the door. And when he stands next to that, you know, goes over to the window, now his shadow is cast inside the apartment. It's 42 feet long and wide. And now it's the biggest Joe D I've ever seen. And he's like standing there. Eric, come on. What are you doing? Look, everybody, this is embarrassing. What do you, will you just come to the. Ah! It's the monster Joe D. Okay. This is the greatest test of my ability not to have a 16 year old stroke ever. And I'm thinking again, no, 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 I'm stubborn. I'm not doing it. I'm not getting visibly caught. So I outlast him to the point where he says, <laughs> I'm going to be downstairs. Get yourself together, smarten up, and I'll meet you down there. I'm not going anywhere. 
And and Judy's like, good, yeah, good, go so that you can go too. Will you just please go? Because I've seen enough of this show and I hate every minute. I'm not giving any acknowledgement, but there the shadow starts to recede. I get myself together. I leave like, you know, like it's Felix Unger getting that frying pan handed to me. You know, this is where you find out this is where you find out who your friends are, right? Because she wanted nothing to do with me at this moment. Nothing. Just please leave. Okay. So there I go. I sort of, you know, shoulders down and I go down the stairs and I'm waiting. <laughs> see Jody and I'm just hoping you know that it's not going to go too badly I'm obviously so uber caught right now and it is running through my mind how the hell did he do it I have no idea but you know that's something that criminals think about you know they don't really think about contrition and that's what I'm doing I'm like you son of a how did you catch me what a jerk so I'm not showing any of that until I get to the car and who do I see sitting in the car? It's our eldest brother, Joey Delgado. And it occurs to me immediately what must have happened. Because the gate that I've been talking to you about is right in front of the bedroom window of Joey Delgado. And so he's not even looking at me. I get into the back seat of the car. Nobody says one single word for the entire ride home. And that whole time, they're both just looking straight forward. A team against the kid, the poor, disadvantaged child who's just trying to hang in in the social strata that I had put myself in. Not a peep. And all I can see is, okay, here's what happened. I go doing my little regular thing. (laughs) Joey's awake. Joey hears. Joey looks out the window. Joey sees Eric. And what does he do? He goes and wakes up Joe D. And the two of those sons of bitches get in the car. And the only way they could have, think about this, the only way they could have found exactly where I was, was to follow me as I ran the 2.9 miles in the car. So we get home. It's an absolute disaster there. Olga Munoz has been crying the entire 48 minutes or whatever it's been. And so I get every barrel that exists from all of them. How could you? This is horror. Why would you do a thing like this? Yeah, you're irresponsible, lying, all the, everything. Joey Delgado, Exit stage left immediately. Just leads me to them. I've done my work here. Off to bed. So I don't even remember if I receive any actual punishment. Maybe they're working it out. I don't know. One thing I can tell you is they're not about to take the job away from me because 25% is coming in on a regular basis. 30, 40 bucks a week, okay? Because of the job, I don't have a whole lot of freedom to begin with. So it's not like they're going to ground me. What's that mean? You know, between 9, 30 and 11, you can't go anywhere. So I don't think anything particularly happens other than that they're disappointed. And now they're they were going to be keeping a better eye on things. OK, so next day or so, I run into Jeff and he asks me. So, you know, I'm sorry I couldn't make it. You know, everything go OK. No, it went very not OK. I got absolutely busted and it was terrible. And so he's, you know, he's, <laughs> he's like my friend. So he's like, oh, that sucks. That's a shame. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, eventually you were going to get caught. I mean, geez, you know, you're sneaking out with the thing. You know, it doesn't even occur to him that I should have squeaky oiled the freaking hinge, but still. You know, that, that's a shame. You know, I mean, you know, if you had a car, you know, you could get, you could still have an opportunity. You know, you could still do things. You know, that's your main problem is that you don't have a car. I'm like, yeah, I don't have a car. I don't have a driver's license. I have no ability. So, yeah, there's no way. There's no There's no getting a car. So then Jeff says the thing. Well, you know, I could, I could sell you a car. What? You, he could sell me a car. 
Now's a good time to remember some things, like that Eric is 16, has no driver's license and won't be getting one anytime soon, and has no idea about things like insurance and registration. When Eric reminds Jeff of some of these facts, he says, uh, You know, we, we, we just sell you the car, you know what I mean? I just sell you the car, right? <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. So, how much is the you know how much is the car? I don't ask about what car it is. Like I I could not care. I could not possibly care. So uh, for uh, four hundred bucks, you know, I sell you a car. Okay. All right. Let's. Okay. Show me. Let, let's see the car. So he shows me the car. It happens to be right there. What do you know? And he leads me to. He's probably got four or five cars on his property at this point. None of them are appealing, but he takes me to the absolute ugliest possible car that really could be in existence at this time. And this car is a 1974 Ford Pinto, which is pea soup green and looks like it was attacked, you know, by a gang with like rocks and maybe cannonballs or something like that. There's there's not a single part of it that isn't dented or rusted. It looks like it's been flipped over. It's got rope tying the hatchback to the back. It's it's the ugliest. I mean, I thought I've seen ugly car. This is the ugliest car I've ever seen. The sign on the car advertising the car. He's trying to sell this car. To advertise the car, here's what the cardboard sign says. Good shit box. I've never even heard the term shit box at this point in my life. It sounds awful. There's shit in the box. So I say, I look at that thing and I say, deal. So what do I need to get this thing rolling? Literally. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you give me, give me a 150 bucks. Okay. Then you pay me, you know, 25 bucks a week. We'll put you on a, we'll put you on a payment plan. Okay. And believe it or not, I, because I'm a working man. I actually have $150. I have it. So if you think that's going to stop me, it ain't. So I give Jeff $150. He gives me a key. And I notice that in the place that the the license thing, whatever the you know thing that hangs on the back of it, I can't remember what that's called at the time, the thing that, you know, probably means something. That's not there. Instead is another piece of cardboard. And on the cardboard, written really sloppily, says, Lost Tag. Okay, I guess, okay, cool. So that's my identifier. All right, no problem. So key, okay? So now I need to, you know, kind of know, okay, I got to know the little ins and outs of the vehicle. I see that it's got a, what I come to learn is called a stick shift. Okay, well, in my vast experience driving cars, I've never operated anything like that. It's easy. All right, here's what you do. You got to push this thing in. You got to push the pedal here over that. Get it at the same time. And then you got to let it off and push this other one at the same time. Just so much. Bing, bing. And there you go. Now and, And now you drive. Okay, goodbye. So now I'm now I've entered the world of driving cars. And wow, wait till Judy finds out about this. I take the car and I do some, you know, self-realization with the vehicle, which is me attempting to learn how to drive this thing. I realize that after 62, 63 attempts to get it into first gear, once you do that, people, then it's a breeze. Okay, just let me tell you. After that, there's no problems. All you have to be able to do, it's those first, you know, 100 feet that are your peril. Just like sneaking out a window. Okay? It's the same thing. So just go for it, all right? So I start doing my driving, and oh boy, the the world just opens up. Freedom everywhere. I can go see friends and go to different locales. I mean, this is way better than meeting Jeff at one in the morning uh, next to the frickin' porthole. And so I have no regrets. The only concern that I have is going to be, what do you know, on the reapproach? Because obviously I can't pull this thing into the Joe D driveway. That can't happen. So now I got to come up with a, you know, hiding spot. So the most logical spot 
is that I can come up with is is not that far away, but it's far away enough. It's like three blocks away down from the house. There's a little it's a weird spot. It's a dead end that turns off of the street that would pass us. It, you come to a dead end on this street and it's past it's not visible from our house and there's no reason that anybody in our family would be in that area at that time so it's also a spot that i i don't even know if i have this concern that it's going to get towed it's sitting there it's it's the most illegal looking vehicle ever with the word lost tag sitting on it but i give this a shot this comes to be the spot that i'm going to park the car I go out of my my jaunts and I get home. I park it there and then I walk the three blocks. I'm shitting bricks the whole time that somebody would have seen me. But once I get to the house and now just let you know, I'm not doing a whole lot of 1 a.m. trips anymore. I'm doing stuff in broad daylight now because, you know, I can. And once again, I roll up on Judy you know, and I get out there like, you know, I'm do I got the John Cusack with the with the boombox over my head in front of the Pinto. You know, I'm playing in your eyes and she's looking out the apartment window and I'm like, hey, look at me now. I'm this guy. And she goes for it. So now I'm back. I'm back in the fray. And again, life is uh, OK. The only problem I have is that I absolutely cannot drive a stick shift. I'm the worst stick shift driver maybe on the road at this point. Every single time is 62 attempts. Every single time. So the main problem I have is that I really never want to stop the car. If I can avoid stopping the car, that I'm going to do. Any red light situations is pure terror. I don't really even consider exactly how much terror it is i have no driver's license i have no insurance i have no registration i have no tag i have nothing and i can't drive the damn car so i can't even imagine (laughs) i can't imagine what's gonna happen to me if if something happens but judy has a little more experience with that and she then adds to my level of concern by letting me know you can't no absolutely not they're not just gonna say okay you know, you don't, you can't get a note from your mom. So you can never let that happen. So instead, I'm now, I, you can add to the, all those things. Now you can add reckless driver to the list because I'm running every single light if need be. Whatever it is, the situation starts getting yellow 100 yards back. Forget it. Zoom with my little Pinto right through the intersections all over town. And this is working out. Let me tell you, this is working out for at least nine days. Okay. So, like a charm, pulling in to the house, going down the dead end, doom, get back in the house. Nobody suspects a thing. And Judy and I, it, we're having the l- time of our lives out in the world, 2 p.m. on a Saturday, going, w- going to Carvel, you name it. All these things are happening. Anytime somebody's in the car, which happens because, you know, hey, I got friends. And so now I'm a, I'm a guy with a car. So everybody is aware, okay, look, if everybody gets in the car with this understanding, if we ever get pulled over for any reason, if there's any attempts from any sort of authority to approach this vehicle, it's every man for himself. Don't let yourself get attached to anything you are not willing to walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat around a corner. And so you want to ride? Yeah, let's go. So I'm giving people rides under that pretense the entire time. No problem. There we go, zipping around town. And so here comes a day when we're actually pulling into the mall. The mall is, it's it's big. There's a road that enters on one side and it probably goes for maybe a mile and a half around the perimeter of the mall. And it goes in like a half circle. And so it's a time when if you wanted to, you could sort of pretend you're like an indie car racer or something like that zipping through there and there's never any challenge by anybody and so on this day it's myself it's judy and it's this other girl in the back seat and we're hanging out having a good time and i'm driving too fast and judy's letting me know and i'm telling her i've got it will you let me just leave me i know what i'm i know what i am doing and i'm probably going 60 or something like that through the mall parking lot and 
what do you know? To, to my shock and chagrin, I lose control of the vehicle. And the vehicle slams into the side of the parking rail. Boom. The accident is actually not that bad. No one is hurt and the car is fine. Well, except for one thing. It has a flat tire. So changing a tire is, no, is not foreign to me. However, on this particular occasion, it's got to be done with a little bit of brevity. And so, okay, everybody relax. Okay, we're going to push the car. The, the car wedged up against the railing. So it's not going to be easy. I've got to like get it out of position and all of that. And while I'm working through all of this, that's when I, I see the cop approaching from probably a half mile away. And I am sure in retrospect that this cop it, it probably thinks that he's coming to help for all he knows. However, this is the immediate signal that everybody must bail. And so I'm ready for this. The cop comes. Let's go. Everybody out. Grab your shit. I have nothing in the car other than myself. So here the other, the girl in the back's grabbing her school books. Let's go. Let's go. And right next to the railing is a six foot chain link fence, which leads to a golf course. And so my thought is I'm not going to challenge him in the mall. I don't think that's going to work out. This is the better strategy. So there I am pushing these girls over the chain link fence as quickly as I can, probably two handed, shoom, get them over. I hop the thing all in it. I mean, it is split second. The adrenaline is flying. The only thing that sucks is that once the cop gets there, obviously he realizes this is not just some aiding a person with a flat tire, but these are kids on the run. And again, chain link fence, he could see us running. So now I'm just direct, run, fat, no, faster, left, run, tree, hide. And there we go. Cops are scrambling, you know, it takes, it takes time. We completely evade the law. So, so we escape and probably to my advantage, because it's not that I, like I gave this a lot of thought. Remember, thing identifiable to me with the car, which works out great because I just decide to never go back. And I just abandon the car right there. That's it, never, that's it. I don't even know what happens to the car. I have no, <laughs> I have no knowledge. Obviously, it's somewhat connected to Jeff. And so he becomes aware of this. So now here it is, maybe the next day, and, and he comes, I, I probably come across him and he, <laughs> and he wants to know what happened. In fact, now that I think about it, I let him know before. So he probably doesn't even know yet. So I let him know. And the reason I'm letting him know is because I still owe him money. It's only been like two weeks. So I've given him like an additional 50 bucks. And so now I probably owe him another 200. And I... <laughs> The way I basically approach him is to be like, yeah, I just wanted to let you know I'm not going to be paying for the rest of that car, okay? Because let me tell you what happened, all right? You little shitty car. Let me tell you what. It, it broke, okay? So I'm not paying for, like, broken merchandise, all right? So, you know, just letting you know, I will not be fulfilling our deal. And he's like... <laughs> What the hell are you talking about? Of course you owe me the $200. You owe me the... Now you're telling me you wrecked the car and... Uh, yeah, dude. What do you want me to do? The car... The car obviously doesn't control itself. So I hit the thing. What'd you expect would happen? I'm not paying for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you are paying for it. And then I, it occurs to me, which is exactly what I say to him. What are you going to do about it? Now, this is really the first time in my 16 year life that I have ever confronted because I really was, in spite of everything you've heard, I really was raised in a way that you do not confront adults. And so in this moment, I'm standing toe to toe with this guy in his front yard. And I'm not only confronting him, but I'm like daring him. And I say, what are you gonna do about it? Well, you know, why don't we talk to your father? Let's see what, you know, see what he thinks about it. Yeah, you know what? Good idea. Let's go talk to him. Let's go talk to him about you giving me rides over to my girlfriend's 
36 times and when that didn't work out that you sold me a car a kid without a driver's license and you just gave me a car let's go you know what come on let's go right now and i started even you know bluffing him to go walk to the house. let's go whoa, whoa hey hey whoa hey all right we're like, hey don't go no don't go nowhere you have something to say? All right, look, hey, all right look, let's just let it go. All right, let's just let the whole thing go. I'm like, that's right, because there's five feet, seven inches of Joe D, 162 pounds waiting to talk to your ass if you got a problem, okay? You think about that. So I am successful in my entire journey with that Pinto. Except, you know, yeah, excluding the fact that, you know, I may have broken a law or two along the way. And is it, that's the end of your story? <laughs> that's the end of the Pinto. That's the end of the Pinto. I never and see that Pinto again. I see. And how did it go with Judy after the Pinto? Well, coincidentally, um, shortly after the demise of the Pinto, Judy unceremoniously dumped me. Now, I don't know if there's a connection, to be honest with you. I never really thought about it. There could be a connection, but I'm not sure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stories My Brother Used to Tell. This true story was told to you by Eric Delgado. Produced and edited by me, Dan Delgado. Music by Epidemic Sound. If you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you did, then you can feel free to leave us a nice review wherever you can. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. Or better yet, tell someone who might enjoy it. It may or may not help this show get noticed, but it will warm my cold, dead heart. You can also help the show out by buying me and Eric a coffee. Yes, this is really a thing. It's basically a one-time donation. There is a link in the show notes on how to do it, or you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash the industry. You can contact me through email if you like. It is dan at moviemaker.com. I am on Twitter at underscore dan underscore delgado or on threads at dan delgado 74. That's it for today's story. Coming up next time, you know... This is 1987, okay? You get things done based on, you know, being good looking. That's how you did stuff. That's next time on Stories My Brother Used to Tell. Good night.